good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, AFA's Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and uh, welcome to the next event in our Aerospace Nation uh, speaker series. Um, we're very pleased that uh, Lieutenant General uh, Dave Thompson could join us today. Uh, General Thompson is the Vice Commander of the U.S. Space Force, where he's responsible for carrying out space missions and integrating space policy, guidance, coordination, and synchronization of space-related activities for the Department of the Air Force. Uh, welcome, DT, and uh, thanks very much for taking the time to join us today. I'd like to start off by giving you the opportunity to highlight the progress on building out the U.S. Space Force, the critical challenges we're confronting in space, and some of your top priorities as you look into the future. So, over to you, DT. Okay, General Deptula, thanks so much. It's a privilege to be here, not just to talk to you again, but uh, to main con maintain contact with the audience and, and the folks out there who are still working hard every day, figuring out how to get the job done in, a, in this uh, COVID environment we live in. Uh, but to maintain that connectivity is great. And, and I appreciate you and the Mitchell Institute uh, for hosting and continuing this series. Um, yeah, it is, it is absolutely a, a great time to be alive and working in space. I'll tell you that. Um, uh, as we talked about, you know, I, I, I got an opportunity to address AFA uh, in February down in Orlando. Um, you get a sense of what it's li it was like in 1947 with the establishment of the U.S. Air Force in many ways. The first is uh, air power and the air forces of the nation existed long before the creation of the United States Air Force. And what was required at that time was to take those forces, to take the perspective and the structures that they had at the time, adapt them to a new service, and to, uh, I'll say, raise the sights and the vision of that service and what it meant and what air power meant for the nation. And that's a lot of what we're doing today uh, as we create the Space Force. The Space, the United States Air Force and the Department of the Air Force has been engaged in, in space aggressively since the dawn of the space age in the late 1950s, has been a great steward of space capabilities for our military forces and the nation, and now it's our time to take that foundation, that groundwork, and what the Air Force did for all those years and turn it into a new service with an adjusted vision and perspective and what space power needs to be for the future, for the security of the nation, for its uh, uh, economic stability uh, as well. And what that means first and foremost is as we create this new service, we have got to maintain the focus on the missions that we're doing every single day. You know, we're operating every single day, not just as we create a new service, but in this environment that we're all dealing with today, the capabilities we provide for our military forces, for our national leadership, for public safety, for the, for the uh, um, uh, citizens of the nation have to continue to be there, whatever the environment. Um, uh, emergency response forces, uh, logistics folks, uh, the, the, the uh, members of the military and the National Guard who are serving the nation today inside the continental United States as we address this COVID crisis, they've got to use global communications. They've got to be able to trust, as do the American people, the blue dot on their cell phone brought to them by GPS. Our adversaries aren't standing still in terms of um, uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, missile warning. So all of those things have to continue. And the first thing we've got to remember, and we do remember, is the mission takes priority for everything we do. And as we stand up a space force, as we address the, uh, uh, the environment we face today with the coronavirus, that maintain, that is our primary focus. Uh, in fact, we've got a couple of exciting things coming up. We've done many things in the, in the last uh, uh, nine to 10 weeks, but uh, this summer, I'm sorry, this summer, this weekend, uh, we're scheduled uh, to launch the X-37 again. Uh, uh, send that to orbit for the sixth time. That's one big thing that we, the Space Force, are doing. Uh, the other thing that I'm excited about, uh, less so from a space, I'm sorry, less so from a Space Force perspective, but from a national perspective, later this month, NASA is going to fly American astronauts to orbit again on top of American rockets. That remains on track for later this month. The Space Force has a role to play there in terms of the launch range services we provide for their rocket and their astronauts. We also help in coordinating uh, forces to respond if needed in other cases. So, so we, the Space Force, get to return to a, a support role for human space flight that we haven't done to this extent since the flyout of the shuttle. And so I think for, for the Space Force, for the nation, for NASA, we're all looking forward to their return to space flight. 
So those are the things that, that we're first of all worried about. In terms of the stand up of the Space Force, um, we continue to focus aggressively on what, what a lean, agile, aggressive, and future focused force should be. Uh, we continue to design our field command structure where we have uh, made great progress there. We've uh, um, taken that structure through the Chief of Space Operations, General Jay Raymond. We've taken it to our Secretary, Barbara Barrett. Um, we're, we're making sure the rest of our national leadership and senior leadership are satisfied as we start to roll out what that field command structure is going to look like, uh, what a headquarters looks like that's focused on mission and requirements and intelligence. Um, we're doing a lot of work there. As we build the force, we're still in the middle of, of hiring a significant number of people. We're aggressively hiring a civilian workforce. And um, uh, May 1st, we opened up the opportunity for broadly for members of the United States Air Force to transfer into the Space Force. Um, uh, many of you will recall that uh, General, General Jay Raymond and Chief Mass Sergeant Roger Toberman became the first two members of the Space Force. On April 15th, we commissioned another 86 members of the class of 2020 from the United States Air Force Academy into the Space Force. And now the rest of us, folks like me, get the opportunity to, um, to volunteer to transfer into the Space Force as well. So those are some of the things that are, that are uh, going right on right now that we're excited about, as well as um, uh, creating the processes that will make the Space Force what it needs to be and proposing new ways of doing business. We're in the final stages of, of coordinating an alternate acquisition report for the Space Force that it goes to Congress that describes our recommended approach to uh, more quickly and, and agilely and in a more focused sense uh, acquiring the space systems we need to address the threats of today and in the future. So that's kind of where we stand right now, uh, Dave, and uh, um, uh, a lot continues to happen and, and a lot more to come in the days, weeks, and months ahead. Well, thanks for that insight, uh, DT, and uh, thanks for all that uh, you and your team are doing uh, to build the world's greatest Air Force. Um, as you proceed doing that, there are three general areas that are going to need continued attention. You, you touched on some of them, but uh, more particularly resources, uh, personnel, and integration of the multiple organizations that have a, a role in uh, military space. Recognizing that the Space Force is still very much in its youth, um, could you shed a bit of light on uh, your thoughts and potential uh, plans in uh, each one of these areas? Uh, absolutely. I'll, I'll start. I will start with resources. Um, as many of you know, we did in fact, in the budget submission that went to Congress earlier this year, we did in fact, for the first time ever, submit a separate Space Force budget. And we're still in the process. Congress is still in in the process of its deliberation and finalizing that uh, the president's budget for 2021. Um, however, because the Space Force was authorized in December of last year, a lot of the work that was done on that budget was done in the same sense, in the same manner that the Department of Air Force and US Air Force had done for years. So we, we segregated out and provided elements of that budget in 2021. What we're in the middle of now is is we are creating the first ever uh, standalone Space Force budget created from the beginning by the Space Force. Um, but it will continue a lot of the progress that's been made over the last four years. Uh, the Department of Defense has said very specifically, space continues to be a focus area. And the anticipation is that investments will continue to increase in this area as we address the needs of the domain ensuring that our, uh, uh, the capabilities we're, we provide are robust and resilient in the face of attack, um, systems that we're gonna need to address the threats to protect and defend our capabilities, to do, to command and control forces in a warfighting domain, all of those areas continue to be growth areas and focus areas for the department. So we're anticipating not only maintaining the course we have in increased investment in space, but ensuring that those uh, command and control and other warfighting capabilities we've taken for granted in decades in the previous, in, in other domains, we now have to build uh, to defend and protect and ensure those space capabilities are there. So we're, we're in the middle of that budget, that, that tw the 2022 budget cycle as an independent activity, as an independent military service. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, personnel, there's a lot of excitement there. It's not just a matter of, I mean, we're in the process of hiring new folks. We're in the process of 
transferring uh, space professionals or, or offering for transfer of space professionals from the United States Air Force into to the Space Force. But that's just the beginning of the activity on the personnel front. Uh, a, a couple of things there. At, even as we offer the opportunity to uh, Air Force personnel, uh, we're working with the Department of Defense and the other services to open up the opportunity to transfer later uh, this year and perhaps next to uh, uh, space professionals in the Army, space professionals in the Navy and others, if they are in fact interested in transferring to the Space Force. But really uh, what excites us is the opportunity to build the process and the approach to what we want people to be in the future, which certainly applies at some level to guys like me who've you know, got a lot more uh, runway behind me than in front of me, obviously. But um, for those brand new members, those members we're looking to recruit and bring into the service, um, uh, General Raymond has made it clear, this is gonna be a digital service and we're gonna expect digital fluency out of every single member of the Space Force. And so building that approach and that idea for what we're looking for, who we're looking for, how we attract that talent, how we retain that talent and train it to be uh, digitally fluent, um, agile, uh, 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 flexible and innovative is what we're trying to design in, in terms of how we recruit and retain, develop, uh, uh, and use what I'll call the 21st century management approach. Uh, and then, I'm sorry, the third, you asked me about the third item. Tell me again what the third, uh, the third one is. Look, the vice president talked about um, how there are over 60 organizations out there with a hand in space, and that uh, one of the advantages of standing up a space force would be to accomplish, you know, maybe not all, but some consolidation. And again, understanding it's early in the Space Force's life, um, you know, are, are you all thinking about, uh, you know, plans for doing that at some point in the future? We are, we are. And in fact, um, uh, and thanks for that reminder, just, just as we're offering the opportunity um, for individuals who wish to volunteer from other services and other parts of the department to transfer in, we're also working with the Army and the Navy uh, and with the Department of Defense on those capabilities, those functions, and those units that exist out uh, elsewhere in the Department of Defense and working on which ones need to be consolidated into the Space Force um, and the plan to integrate them into the Space Force in future years. I think you know some of our, some of your, the folks joining today know that earlier this year, Secretary Barrett already directed the realignment and reassignment of uh, 23 Air Force organizations, organizations that do space-related activities that weren't in what used to be Air Force Space Command. She's already directed that realignment. We're working on the same type of activity with the Army and the Navy so that later this year in 2022, perhaps in 2023 as well, we will be realigning some of those functions. And I will tell you, not just that realignment, but um, the authorities provided to the, the uh, Chief of Space Operations in law and from the, the Secretary of Defense um, have already made it clear that they expect that Chief of Space Operations and the Secretary of the Air Force and the Department of the Air Force to take a leading role in space formally in ways that they haven't and we haven't in the, in the past to bring some, some additional synchronization and leadership to those 60 plus organizations. All right, thanks very much. Let's uh, uh, talk a bit about what's happening in commercial space. You know, uh, I don't have to tell you and our audience that over the past decade, uh, there's really been a boom in uh, commercial space development. Uh, but the COVID-19 crisis has uh, led investment to cool off. Uh, and there's some companies face financial challenges, and in the case of one, uh, one web uh, bankruptcy. Um, what's your approach to keeping this innovation base uh, healthy and specifically in the case of OneWeb uh, that DOD had planned on using for LEO satellite communication tests and high north communications? How are you planning on ensuring that its assets are not bought off by Chinese companies in the bankruptcy sale later this summer? Well, uh, so let me start uh, uh, generally. Certainly, as we are with many, uh, I'll say many uh, of many uh, commercial sectors across the nation, uh, not just in the national security sector, but certainly in the national security sector, in the space sector, commercially, civilly, and others, 
Um, we, like many folks, are greatly concerned about uh, the threat this uh, coronavirus poses to that. Um, uh, recently, so one of the one of the um, uh, one of the things that the national that the National Defense Authorization Act did in 2019 was establish what was called the Space Acquisition Council and gave it a charter to do things related to national security space. But that uh, body and that group of leaders, including uh, um, Assistant Secretary of the Air Force, Dr. Roper for acquisition, the Under Secretary of the Air Force, uh, Mr. Manasco, General Raymond as the Chief of Space Operations and others, recognized that what they really needed to do quickly was consider um, the threat that this virus posed to commercial space to smaller space companies in the um, commercial and national security sector and what they might do about it. And so just a couple weeks ago, they held a specific, they called a specific out of cycle meeting to look at the things that we can do. And it's gonna depend on a couple of things. First of all, they have uh, uh, built what I would call a list of proposed investments that we can do quickly, um, working with the White House and with Congress to help provide, let's just say provide capabilities we know we need, areas we need to be more aggressive in, that are also gonna help the, um, the uh, commercial and national security space sector. Um, and then I will say with respect to OneWeb specifically and others, we continue to work not just, we work with the White House and, and we'll be working with Congress, not just focused on OneWeb, but all of the commercial space companies that face bankruptcy, that face, concern, that face those concerns and see what we can do in terms of securing the capabilities we need for national security, number one, but considering things like ensuring that potential adversaries don't have the opportunity to, to, to acquire those capabilities and use them uh, against us. Um, as the potential for collisions between uh, spacecraft and debris increase, uh, efforts from within the Department of the Air Force and internationally to improve data sharing across global space domain awareness sites has increased. Um, do you see this sharing trend uh, continuing, uh, and are there any upcoming changes uh, to these policies? Uh, so, absolutely, see the trend increasing. Um, this is a this is a partnership activity we've been working on the military side for several years now with many of our close space allies and and partners. Um, we've been working for years with the United Kingdom and with Canada and with um, uh, New Zealand and Australia. We've since added France and Germany. Japan is one of those new partners. We have others we're looking to expand as well um, for a couple of reasons. One is day-to-day -day for the benefit of, of the world, this needs to be a safe and stable and secure operating environment. And with the growth of access, the growth of use, but at the same time, the potential growth of debris and the proliferation of uh, uh, commercial constellations. We have got to be able to share all of the data we have um, um, more in a more timely fashion, make it as accessible for space uh, for safe space flight. And so it's not just a matter of us working with our military partners. We have established a close working relationship with the Department of Commerce, who's assumed that responsibility by presidential policy from a civil perspective to build out the right sorts of infrastructure to do data sharing, um, the methods by which they're gonna do data sharing, policies uh, to do data sharing and the use of that data. And I only see that growing in the future. It's gonna be vital to do that, to ensure that space is accessible, that it's stable and it's secure for commercial, civil um, and national security use going into the future. Uh, let's talk a bit about some of those uh, agencies out there. One of them is the Space Development Agency. It was stood up to improve space research and development speed and thinking prior to the establishment of the Space Force. Uh, now that the Space Force is handling the organized, train and equip space mission, what role, if any, uh, will the Space Development Agency play in uh, Space Force acquisition? Uh, yeah, great question, thanks. First of all, the reasons it was established before the establishment of the Space Force still make sense today. Primarily, um, leveraging commercial investment. We talked a little bit about uh, where commercial investment stands today, um, uh, how it's moving forward, but potentially how it's threatened uh, it, with the, the economic crisis that we face right now. 
And so the role that they needed to play before the Space Force was creating, helping us to, to quickly look at commercial investment, um, uh, a, let's call it a set of the, of the national security space architecture that hadn't been fully addressed today, um, that role still applies. In fact, before the creation of the Space Force, Space and Missile System Center, the Space RCO, uh, SDA and others were working together to figure out how to ensure they were working in a complementary fashion and they weren't being duplicate and we, duplicative and we still weren't leaving gaps. So um, as we move forward, that role still applies to SDA today. Um, uh, we're working with them and in our design and planning activities to see the role that they would play in the Space Force. And personally, I would say uh, just as in industry, just in the commercial market, uh, competition improves the breed. And so for the opportunity for our, our internal uh, acquisition organizations to be able to think innovatively, come up with approaches and, and, and work off of each other, I think that's a good thing for the Space Force, for our acquisition processes going forward and for the nation. Uh, thanks. Now, the other services have uh, traditionally had an important mission of ensuring free access and movement in international and open areas inside the atmosphere. Um, with, with both traffic and potential hostile actions on orbit, will the Space Force act in a similar capacity? And, and if so, how can the Space Force ensure freedom of navigation in space? Uh, good question. Uh, I would say, first of all, uh, let's talk about maybe in three, quickly in three ways. The first is uh, freedom of navigation in space, I would argue, uh, was established with the launch of Sputnik in 1957, right? It, it, uh, um, it circumnavigated the globe many times. It overflew every landmass. It overflew just about every country. And so in that sense, established the fact that spacecraft launched in the orbit are entitled and actually demand by physics the ability to overfly their nation. So that first right, I think, was established from the dawn of the space age. Uh, the second part of it is we've talked about a, a little bit already, and the Space Force has a role to play, but hopefully that role will be increasingly a supporting role with the Department of Commerce and civil and regulatory agencies just to ensure that those that operate in the domain do so uh, in a way that, that uh, promotes uh, use, promotes safety of flight, um, but also establishes what I'll call the appropriate uh, standards and norms of behavior for how responsible spacefaring nations and organizations operate in flight every single day. As you know from, from your career and many others do, whether it's in the air or at sea, um, whether it's in national airspace, international airspace, uh, the oceans of the world, there are standards by which civilian operators, militaries, and others operate in those domains, operate in a peaceful sense, in a safe sense. And so I think part of our job is to enforce and, and participate and support some of those. But at the end of the day, I would also say the third element of freedom of navigation, I would also call freedom of action. It's gonna be our job to ensure that we maintain freedom of action in space across the spectrum of conflict, which means um, increasingly based on the threats from other nations we are gonna defend and protect our use of space, which also means defend and protect our capabilities in space to provide freedom of action, regardless of what any adversary might, might think or try to do to prevent us from doing so. Uh, very good. Uh, on a related issue in terms of uh, uh, what's going on in uh, space, keeping a US force posture mobile and flexible is crucial to keeping one step ahead of our adversaries. Uh, a recent example being less predictable U.S. bomber deployments to the Pacific. How can the United States bring that same kind of operational unpredictability uh, in space while at the same time ensuring safe space traffic awareness? Um, uh, a good question. I think so. So I think we do that already today, and we just need to build on it. Uh, in fact, I guess I'll use it as, as an example. Um, Let's talk about the X-37, right? We're gonna launch it. We've just, we're gonna launch it here on Saturday. Um, uh, we, it'll be at sixth flight. We've been flying it for years. We operate it in a safe manner, right? We always, we put it into a, an orbit. We, we make sure that that 
that it operates in orbits and when it maneuvers, it does so in a safe manner. It doesn't threaten other objects. Um, it's there, uh, but at the same time, uh, we don't necessarily talk a lot about what it does. It's an experimental test bed. We use it to test technologies. We use it to test operational concepts. You know, this time we're gonna fly uh, uh, Air Force Academy Falcon Sat and some NASA technology. But I think the X-37 is an example by which we, um, we can expand, by which we operate safely. We operate in a responsible manner in the domain but at the same time, don't need to tell the world uh, everything that we're doing with every single platform all the time. In fact, I mean, I think we have an interesting history where we, where in some cases we talk in great detail about what our space systems are, what their capabilities are and what they do for the nation. And in a general sense, we need to, just as we talk about what a bomber or what a transport uh, plane or what others might do for the nation. But there are some things we need to talk less about, even as we, talk about what their capabilities are, or how we provide space services for uh, the, the nation and for our military forces, even as we continue to operate in what I'll call a safe and a predictable manner with respect to conduct of operations at home. Very good. Well, offensive and defensive, and defensive uh, space capabilities have proliferated uh, greatly among uh, peer adversaries in uh, uh, recent uh, years. What's our strategy to get ahead and remain a dominant in the space while at the same time maintaining our international commitments? Uh, uh, so a couple of things. Uh, the first is, as you said, um, uh, it was not our choice to make space a warfighting domain. Our adversaries have made it very clear that they intend to uh, limit or remove our use of space in crisis and conflict. And just as in every other domain, uh, we, are, we will not allow that to happen. We can't allow that to happen in space. So, so we have to ensure that, that our capabilities are there, that they're uh, resilient in the face of attack, that we take necessary steps to defend and protect them. Um, and, and so we will do so, and we're on a path to do so with uh, our investments in capabilities, our investments in training, and the development of uh, space, what have been space operators in the past to be space warfighters today and in the future. But in terms of partnerships, um, uh, just as we operate in coalitions in other domains, it's clearly long since time that we operate in coalitions in space as well. Uh, uh, first and foremost, I mean, we've learned that from decades and, and centuries of, of experience in other domains is, is you want to operate in coalitions. The second is, um, you know, decades ago in space, there were just a few actors. Um, it took superpowers to operate in space. Um, and so you could envision a world in which a single nation could do and had to do the only thing it needed, all, everything it needed to do in space, whether it was the United States or back then the Soviet Union or others. Increasingly, we can't afford and we shouldn't afford to do it all. And uh, relying on partners to participate in, in uh, 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 stable use of the environment, security, and actually uh, um, uh, defending the, the um, domain and also deterring adversaries, it just makes sense to do that with a coalition with partners in space, just like it does in the air, at sea, on land, and, and, and in cyberspace. I'm um, speaking of deterrence. Um, what's your approach regarding investments in counter space capabilities? Uh, the Space Force recently publicized a uh, ground-based satellite jamming uh, capability, but in your mind, um, what's the place in the counter space portfolio um, for non-kinetic uh, counter satellite systems such as uh, ground-based lasers and uh, potentially high-powered microwaves that can engage satellites without uh, causing a significant orbital debris? Um, so I, I would say first and foremost, because we rely on space so tremendously for everything we do, and it really is one of those key elements of the advantage we provide to our military forces. Um, our first, first focus in that regard is going to be how we can protect our capabilities, defend our capabilities, make sure that they are there, um, regardless of what the adversary might uh, do to attack. The second thing is, is we have, we recognize that there's a potential there to pollute the domain and to restrict its use in the future if we don't use it responsibly, even in the face of attack. And so 
So just as um, uh, you know, you've seen recently some of the the tests that others have done that that either either created debris in a domain or they're testing weapons in a non-debris forming case that in use would create debris. We've got to look for ways, and we've got to be able to um, develop capabilities that allow us to protect our assets and potentially deny adversaries that don't create long-term harm. You know, and you think about, first of all, you think about in a military sense, that might mean attacks in other domains. We might, we might use other domains to, to create, you know, to conduct offensive space control, as you might imagine, especially, but, but first and foremost, it's a matter of capabilities to defend and protect what we have. And from a deterrent standpoint, make it clear to our adversaries that they should not expect to achieve the objectives they see in attacking us. And so, so to deter use of those sorts of weapons, make it clear that attacking us in space is not the first step towards a gaining advantage on the United States. And that's probably the best and first way, number one, to deter, but number two, to ensure that we don't come to that in space. Hmm. A chief of staff of the Air Force, uh, Dave Goldfein, recently announced that for the next demonstration of uh, the Air Advanced Battle Management System, for the first time ever, uh, U.S. Space Command will be the supported force rather than the supporting force. Could you speak to the significance of this as well as uh, what you're hoping to learn from this uh, demonstration? Uh, absolutely. The first thing is, um, let me talk to uh, the significance of that, and it, 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 it comes a bit to what we the, the question that you just asked. And that is um, increasing recognition across the Department of Defense uh, military leaders, our civilian leaders, all the way down to the soldier, sailors, airmen, marines on the tactical edge, recognize um, uh, how important space is to them in the execution of their missions and the success of their missions and in the protection of the force. And so um, they recognize that, number one, they recognize the threat that is posed to by adversaries who want to take it away. And so see, they see it as their responsibility to help protect use. And as we talked about in the, um, in the previous question, uh, there are lots of ways to protect our space capabilities that aren't specifically focused on the space domain, cyberspace, uh, air power, you know, maritime power, special operations forces. There are a lot of ways to preserve the use of space that don't automatically involve um, specific operations in space. And so this, both the uh, uh, ABMS construct itself and the fact that U.S. Space Command is a supported command is a recognition that everybody has a role to play in protecting the use of our space capabilities. Um, the other piece of that, I think, is and one of the things that General Raymond set us on was um, ensuring that we could do integrated, integrated operations, multi-domain operations with the rest of the joint force, which includes joint all-domain command and control. And we have been building out a space enterprise command and control capability that dovetails nicely into that, into that system and also um, uh, contributes our piece of what needs to be done for joint all domain command and control. And so this demonstration is gonna help demonstrate not just the importance of the mission, but how we are going to link into that enterprise and the, the approach to the future for all forces so that JADC2 delivers what it needs to for the, the joint force in the mission. Now you spoke, you touched on this just a little bit before, but I, I wanted to uh, have you dig down a little bit more in terms of uh, what our allies um, are, are looking to see, how they can get more involved with uh, Japan being one of the most recent prominent examples. Um, could you speak to your efforts to date on allied co uh, cooperation in uh, space, um, as well as to what steps you think partners and allies can take to contribute to uh, enhanced space security? Uh, absolutely. In fact, it's been a, it has now been a, a journey, a, a, a major journey for approaching a decade. I think we really started this initiative, uh, took a major step in 2012 and been, been building consistently since then. And where we started was absolutely in areas where we could collaborate, cooperate, and we very much saw eye to eye. 
And that began with uh, space domain awareness. At the time called space situation awareness, now called space domain awareness. Many of these nations have information, have capabilities, and have a desire to build their own space situation awareness, whether it's with existing sensors, with new sensors, with new capabilities, both on the ground and in space. And so we started there as, as the, the more we all understand and share and can, can uh, uh, understand what's happening in the domain, the more secure and stable it's gonna be. The Japanese are a great example. Um, uh, they, they recently announced that you know, they've got a new uh, uh, unit of the Japanese Space Defense Force that they went ahead in that direction. We have a great partnership in several areas with Japan, we're in fact building a um, space situational uh, uh, awareness sensor that we're gonna launch on their QZSS satellite. Their QZSS satellite is basically the Japanese version of GPS. We're gonna share there. We've talked about ways to, to share data back and forth more effectively, to let the new Japanese deep space radar that they're building here will be ready in the next couple of years contribute to that. We're doing that, and we started there with, uh, uh, with our, our coalition and allied partners. Um, the other place that we've done significant work with them on in the past has been uh, satellite communications, right? Every military force, not only internally, but with others, needs to be able to communicate. And so we, we have a host of partnership and sharing agreements in, in the satellite communications front. What has happened increasingly in, in years with those organizations through things like uh, the the co coalition activity and the combined component we have today in U.S. Space Command, as well as the Schriever War Game series. The Schriever War Game series has been a series of war games we've used first in the Air Force, now in the Space Force, for years to work through partnership and coalition things together. That has helped our partner nations understand and help us talk about the threats we face in space and how we might work those together. And so that's been vital in terms of operational, strategic, and actually on a national policy level, engage those nations, ours and others, in the types of uh, discussions we need uh, uh, to talk about the security of the domain and how we ensure that we can operate effectively and across any sort of environment. Well, General Thompson, uh, thanks again for your comments on these uh, critical issues and the insights uh, that you provided uh, today. Uh, on behalf of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, as well as uh, all the Air Force Association, we wish you all the best as you continue to deal with the challenges that affect the security and well-being of uh, every American. Uh, you. you bet. And as a reminder to our listeners, the next event in our series will be with the Air Force Vice Chief of Staff, General uh, Sevy Wilson. Uh, that's going to be next Wednesday, the uh, 20th of uh, May.